Thank you for coming here to tonight. And uh, um, I'm Melody Brown Birkins. I am the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth in the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I am so excited after Zooms and conversations to have author and professor Katie Didden here to speak with us today. She is an associate professor of English at Ball State University. But what we're going to talk about today is a poet with a special interest in the relationship between text and image, the history of the elegy, and poetry and the environment. Her first book, The Glacier's Wake, won the Lena Miles, yep, Lena Miles Weaver Todd Prize from Pleiades Press and was published in 2013. In 2016, I understand she was awarded a new faculty grant from Ball State to conduct research in Iceland and begin working on a book of poems where the lava of Iceland speaks with the focus of a burning glass. Entitled now, Or Choir, The Lava of I on Iceland, the description of the book that speaks to me is itself a poem. Lava reveals how language itself is a record of collisions. Poem as matter, sound as force, form as friction. And what does it mean to be human in the face of such ancient forces especially as climate change unsettles the earth that anchors us. I'm, many of you may know, I'm actually a geologist by training here out of Dartmouth. So to be able to be the Institute of Arctic Studies director, to bring in amazing voices, and then to talk about lava speaking as a geologist and what about climate change anchors us is very moving. So um, thank you for this. And I, we are so honored to have you here, Professor Didden, to talk about it and all that the lava has to tell us. Um, I want to say a little bit more that you have published work in journals such as Ecotone, The Spoon River, Poetry Review, Image, Poetry, 32 Poems, and The Kenyon Review, and your poems have been featured in Verse Daily and Poetry Daily. Professor Dinn earned her MFA with the University of Maryland and her PhD from the University of Missouri. Her work has been recognized with fellowships from Breadloaf, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Suwani, I probably said that wrong, Writers Conference. And she held the 2013-2014 Hotter Fellowship at Princeton University. She served as a poetry editor for the Missouri Review. Currently, or maybe this was back in 2016, was working on as an assistant poetry editor for Memorius Magazine and served on advisory boards for Pleiades Press. My thanks again to, uh, for being here today. My thanks to her cousin, Dartmouth professor Lisa Baldez, for bringing her to the attention of Dickey Center uh, director Tori Holt and then to myself. Also want to extend a thanks to Still North Books uh, for being part of this event and to Dartmouth's Environmental Humanities Group, who co-sponsored, and I think have people online. And finally, I wanted to say thanks to Arctic Program Manager Sana Siddiqui for beautiful posters, and Lars Blackmore in the Dickey Center for wonderful outreach to campus in the Upper Valley community. Again, uh, we're very excited to have you here and have people listening to the words of the lava and yourself. Thank you. Poppins, I have pockets and pockets. Okay. Okay, we're going to try the wireless mic. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Great. So, thank you so much, Melody, for that introduction. And I'm really delighted to be here. Grateful to Sana for inviting me and Melody for inviting me, and also to my cousin Lisa for connecting us and for making this possible. Uh, and thanks to all of you for being here on this snowy day. It's not often that I get to read poems to anybody but poets, so I was really excited uh, to prepare for this. It made me think of the work in a new way, so even the preparation was really wonderful uh, at the invitation, so thank you. More than anything else, I'm excited to be a student here for the next couple days and to learn from all of you at the Institute for Arctic Studies. Your work could not be more important as we face the challenges and uncertainties that come with human accelerated climate change. I'm a poet and I'm fascinated by geology. My story is a good example of what a liberal arts education can do. As an undergrad, I took geology classes to fulfill my science requirements. And at the same time, I was taking my first poetry workshops 
and those subjects somehow fused in my mind. Thinking about lava activates my imagination, and I share this in common with many artists, including Diane Burko, we met a few months ago, and she offered, to, uh, she offered these images to uh, accompany my talk. So see, these are some of her paintings. We discovered we both had done projects focused on lava, projects focused on glaciers, uh, and she's now working with, uh, working, looking at climate change, so we had uh, simpatico. So maybe this is a good ground for our own conversation today, just thinking with these images. I also love to hike, and many of my poems begin on trips to the North Cascades or Death Valley and Patagonia. My love for the environment is intuitive. I'm not the kind of person who knows the Latin names of trees or who can identify birds by their song, or I can't explain to you in scientific terms what causes eruptions or tectonic collisions or global warming, though I am doing my best to learn those things. I'm also, I'm not a philosopher or a theologian ready to debate whether features of the environment, not just trees and birds, but rocks and ice are sentient. But I am a poet. Like Emily Dickinson, I dwell in possibility. As a writer, I make sense of experience by shaping it into patterns of form, and especially patterns of rhythm. My ideas take shape in words. My trade is association. One thing is like another. The boundaries blur, so the brain can be a cedar chamber, its roof a sky. And so I can spread my hands wide to gather paradise. If the truth I'm after is emotion, the test of that truth is music. Yeats taught us crickets sing. Harjo hears the trees speaking. Maybe, like me, you felt the low hum of a wasp whir through your body before you heard it in your ear. I started to write poems in the voices of creatures and features of the natural world because of a wasp that would visit my studio and hover lethargically like a ghost. When it died, my neighbor, who knew the wasp was a muse, placed it on an index card on which she'd written, R.I.P. Raphael, and <laughs> gave it to me. I put it on my desk and I studied how it looked. It looked human and not at all human at the same time. Two eyes, segmented body, folded wings, one antenna raised like a final insight. What got me was the way its legs were folded neatly over its body, like how we fold the hands of our dead. It looked holy. Because the wasp was named Raphael, I wrote about archangels and uh, Renaissance painters. As I chose a form for the poems, I felt the wasp would speak in short lines, short bursts of rhythm, surrounded by a lot of space. The form I found was tiny tercets cinched in the middle like the body of a wasp. When I thought about what it would mean to see Caravaggio's painting, The Taking of Christ, through the eyes of a literal wasp, I noticed different things than I would have uh, seen otherwise. It gave me a new angle of perception on both the painting and the gospel story. After that, I wanted to know what the wasp thought about many things, from weddings to Kierkegaard. It became a generalist that I would consult from time to time. In my life, writing these poems changed my relationship to wasps. My fear mixes with a wider feeling of connection and curiosity. It's not that I believe that wasps are human, but writing those poems helped me to consider their agency. As the poet Alexis Pauline Gum said in an interview with Adrienne Marie Brown, when she writes in the voice of a manatee, it's not to make the manatee more human, it's to actually try to dissolve the idea of what human is, because that idea is blocking the communion and right relationship that we have to create. So I'll read you one of the wasp poems.
The Wasp on Renaissance Painters. Imagine the Virgin imagining figs. Paint a Mary who stares at a plate of sliced figs. Imagine the cherubs imagining figs. Imagine green, cappuccino yellow. Imagine mercurial vermilion in the black background of a body. See my oiled wing as the armor of Romans who grip in the post-kiss of Judas, the luminous cursor of figs. Speaking in the voices of non-human creatures and things is not a new idea. The first poet that comes to mind for me is Ovid. In the Metamorphoses, he describes hybrid creatures like the god Pan, who's part human-shaped, part goat, or like centaurs, half horses, half humans. In so many stories, Ovid writes of humans who transform, like Daphne who turns into a laurel tree to escape Apollo. The tree is both Laurel and Daphne. In my first book, after I wrote about the wasp, I also wanted to write in the voice of a glacier and the voice of a sycamore. I made the wasp poem into a formula. First, I assigned each of those new characters a secret secondary persona. I modeled the glacier on Perito Moreno in Patagonia. When I went there, I was struck by how many people were taking pictures of the glacier. And this was back when there were camera flashes, so it looked like paparazzi. So everyone was <laughs> So I thought that the glacier was like a former Hollywood starlet, that we'd come to see its aging, um, its demise. So here are two of the glacier poems from The Glacier's Wake. The Glacier on Lack of Sleep. When day comes, the light's too bright. A yawn forms behind the spires of your eyes. Your jaw cracks, splits a crevasse. Little parts of you collapse. If you were older or cared less about being seen, you would lie down in public. And this is The Glacier on Middle Age. The threat of death breathes its heat on your neck, softens your features, finally teaches your youth to you. The inner light that shone in your face is snuffed by a rough powder, by boot scuffs. Yet compression gives an age-obscuring gleam, a startling blue. Your beauty is now up to you. After my first book was published, I wanted to continue working in this method. It was really generative for me. I felt like fiction writers must feel when they have a novel that they're working on or characters to return to. Uh, and I knew I wanted to write in the voice of lava. When I, th I took a geology class in undergrad called Ring of Fire, and we read a lot of um, different things in that class, including John McPhee's Control of Nature. And so I had this first thought about lava. So lava to me, when I thought of its secret secondary persona, I thought it was like an artist, um, something, someone who's preoccupied with forms, with creation and destruction. Uh, when I was trying to think of the form I would use to access the voice of lava, because the form is important for achieving different voices, the poetic form of erasure came to mind. And this process is when poets take a block of prose, then ink over some of the words and letters leaving a lyric poem in relief. So I'm gonna describe this to you all. But first I wanna give you some examples of contemporary poets who've used the form. Uh, probably the most famous is Tom Phillips who passed away recently, um, but he has a book called A Human Document that he erased and re-erased and re-erased and on every page he created um, visual compositions. So if you see my book, you can see the influence of this. But uh, poets do, you know, sometimes they use organic materials, like these are rose petals. Um, Jen Bervin uh, used blue thread and, had, and sewed over some of the words here. Um, you know, most commonly people call it blackout poetry and they use ink over a text. Uh, Mary Rufel made popular using whiteout. Uh, she has a book called Little White Shadow 
And she creates these artist books where she goes over the text with whiteout. Um, so this is a thing and it's happening everywhere. And most uh, poets I know these days try this technique in some, in some way. Um, despite its ubiquity, erasure is complicated and it's often controversial. And I've written essays trying to come to terms with that. Ultimately, I believe erasure is a form uniquely responsive to our current relationship to the environment. <clears throat> it registers eco-anxieties because it emphasizes the instability of both language and of place, particularly when the subject is the history of land. Take a work like Ronald Johnson's Radios, which is his undoing of Milton's uh, Eden, or Jen Bourbon's The Desert, so the one with the blue thread. She has worked over John Van Dyke's 1901 book called The Desert, so she's creating a new field, uh, working with a team of sewers to create this beautiful, I've got, actually gotten to see it in person, it's this beautiful book. Uh, so she's rethinking Van Dyke's definitions of what a desert is uh, by going into the text and uh, pulling out a different message or a lyric poem. I find Erasure's eco-poetic possibilities to be true, especially in the cases where practitioners preserve the original text, you know, as you can see the text behind it, which I would call kind of exposure, more, more exposure than erasure. And I believe the process exposes the polyvocality inherent in any writing process, in any poetic composition. So it seemed to me that ink flowing over the paper was similar to the process of lava flowing over the land. And the poem that emerges is a new topography. It was the lava that led me to Iceland, one of the only places you can walk beside a divergent plate boundary uh, and has its unique volcanic um, composition. So for this project, I started with all kinds of source texts about Iceland from interviews with Bjork and the first female president of Iceland to the journals of William Morris, to histories, to articles about Game of Thrones, to Siggy's yogurt labels, to all kinds of, uh, I went wide, a very eclectic approach to research. And that I think the idea was that lava sees it all, sees, you know, and lava has things to say about this. Um, so I erased those texts into poems in the voice of lava. So I'm gonna read the title poem from the collection. And I found this poem by studying an interview with Bjork by Matthias Augustiniak and Michael Amzalag for interview. So this is the first line of prose. And then of course, there's the recording we did in the church in Iceland, which was very spontaneous. So this is the uh, passage that I'm erasing and you'll see, I'm gonna move through it and you'll see in red how I move through it. So okay. So this is the lava. Ocean erased, I didn't feel real. I wanted iron songs, ample time, a sphere concert, an oar choir, the core's sly music. So the process is kind of mystical. The voice I find is eerily consistent, and I don't think it's like my other poetic voice. So it's kind of strange to me. And I often feel as a poet, whenever I'm sitting down to write, I'm not a, I don't really know what I'm going to get. I, I have very different um, approaches year to year. So this was very moving to me that somehow writing in the voice of lava, I was able to find a consistency, which was strange. Um, to me, the voice is kind of dragon-like, oracular, booming. And while we think of wasps and trees as having lifespans and we see them grow and move, we often think of stone and ice and earth as, well, maybe less so, ice as inert. And I was surprised to discover that the voice of lava is plural. And the plurality of its voice is not merely a gimmick. In a recent interview with Bjork for Art Forum, Robin Wall Kimmerer points to their common perception of land. And she says, I love the way that language reminds us of that animacy of the living world. 
that those rocks that you speak of are living beings, you know, with their own stories, their own history, their own gifts in the world. And that's something that's so precious to me about the Potawatomi language is that everything's a verb. It isn't just a state of matter. It has agency, right? You know, it could create itself again. It could be something else. What Kimmerer and Bjork discuss makes sense to me. In these poems, I harmonize with the source text, but the source texts are working in concert with each other too. And the poems are collaborative. One of my dearest friends, Kevin Sun, figured out how to make the poems look like lava. I didn't know how to do this. I was sitting there with paint pens one day and we were uh, working together and they always say that if you want to um, get your graphic designer friends to help you is to try something and it'll drive them crazy. And sure enough, <laughs> he said, well, why don't you try this? He said, you could get the person that's working with you to do it this way. And then 10 years we worked on this book together. So, um, which was a total joy. Uh, so this is Kevin's process. I would send him this and then he would set it and he would start to build what he calls the continents. And then he'd have uh, photographs that we, we solicited from friends that had traveled, and artists and writers who traveled to Iceland. And then he would have this, and then he goes even further than this, and he goes in and sets all the grayscale. So I'm gonna, um, so there is a sub-narrative because we, we asked all these people, every time we were working on this, someone would be like, I'm going to Iceland. I'm going, to, I'm going on a residency. And we'd say, send us a photo. <laughs> so there's a, there's a whole conversation here about people that we know who have been drawn to Iceland as for inspiration, so many artists you know, over centuries. And uh, I just saw a talk by Asa Sigurdjohn's daughter, and she calls this Icelandicity. So this seems, I'm kind of, I'm hoping that I'm participating in the, um, the inquiry into Icelandicity, or it could just be an example of it, which you know, I'm not sure about that. Um, so I'm going to read some poems now. And what I'm going to do for you is read the first line of the passage and then read the poem. Okay. So this is a photo by Jennifer Lung. And the primary text is Gudmundur Hafdanarsson's Historical Dictionary of Iceland. And this is his first line. All thingy, the parliament of Iceland, all thingy, is a central institution in Icelandic history and public life. It traces its history back to the beginning of the Commonwealth period. And here's the lava. Art is central, sun and stone. I trace the beginning of the modern. I paint veils. The old fear arises that the public won't care, that the sea is the true genius. I change when I meet air, sending embers arcing in syncopating showers. I still blanch at the void. The answer is again and again to erase the ground. My dearest friends are drawn to this same fire. And this next one is a photo by the poet Diana Coy Nguyen. Um, and it's William Morris's journals from his travels to Iceland. And this is the first line. Meantime, we got off our horses and sat down in a pretty grassy hollow. And the Icelanders brought out champagne and glasses to drink the stirrup cup for they were going back here. And here's the lava. Meteors petrify me. Dead matter vanished into the scantiest of tracks, a white flare, eerily anonymous. I'm Earth's aorta. I thrum against erosion. O oh, spur of the alien cosmos, slinging nerves with feral nickels, fall back into a flat curve just above our resting place. Be no harbinger, usher us godwards on the pulse of our surprise. And this one is uh, 
one of Kevin's photos, and he and I traveled in Iceland together. And this is a text by Isabel Berwick, Beyond the Wall in Iceland's Game of Thrones locations. So she went on a tour of, come see the uh, Game of Thrones sites. So the first line. After visiting the extraordinary lava stacks at Dimuburger, used to film scenes of wildling leader Mance Raider's camp, we drive to lunch on a working farm near the lake. Sing lava, a Dimuburger lay, a lunar acre, a panoramic tremor. Wanderers favor angels, bards obsidian, rock of old, the lava is the dragon. I clot the sky with gold. And this next one is, um, let's see, this next one is another photo of Kevin's photos. And he's vegan, so this is my love letter to him. And it's uh, by this author, Solvig Eric's daughter. It's called Vegan in Iceland. And the first line, so, the first line is, wild thyme and caraway seeds are our special spices. Both grow wild, and Icelandic people have their favorite spots to pick them. So when I was researching this, I was researching all about lichen. I, you know, I spent a week reading about lichen and symbiosis. And so then I went to work on this poem, and uh, I was thinking about the lichen as a kind of Romeo and Juliet. So here we go. <clears throat> or the lava was thinking of this, I guess. Oh, soft, what sun through fungal cells shines green? It is the algae, miles from sea. Lichen, sweetening stone to soil, a reverie. It grows all over as spore-gemmed lines everyone loves. Uh, this next one is the photos by Paige Critcher. And the source is Vanita Salisbury. What exactly is volcano bread? And it's a recipe for volcano bread, which uh, Icelanders make this by uh, filling a tin with um, bread dough, and then they bury it underground, and the geothermal heat actually cooks the bread overnight. So the first line. Back inside, the pink pot had now made its way to the cafe. Siggy lifted the lid, and a sweet-smelling nutty steam wafted out. And here's the poem. Inside time, the future rises, a loaf fit for its tin. But while I dream, rogue steam outs the now in then, and the hours spin. This one is for Lisa, uh, author of Why Women Protest. And this is a uh, Another photo by Diana Wen, but it, the text is Anadis Rudolfstalder, The Day the Women Went on Strike, about the 1975 women's strike in Iceland. First line. The atmosphere at the rally was incredible. Sigrun Bjorn's daughter was a student of 19 and had just found out she was pregnant. The sphere's credo, sudden metamorphosis. Oh, crowd, even iron's mutable. Eden overlaid in gravel, yowls. Scribes annotate the ruin. Stars marled with clay buttress the margins, so the city grid looks helpless, a fly in a galactic web. Drenched in silver, women on earth, a trail of battered shields, a scorched field. I'm gonna read just a few more. This next one is um, the photos by Britt Hultgren. The text is by Paul Walker and Jonathan Hunt. The legacy of Reykjavik and the future of nuclear disarmament. First line. What then is Reykjavik's legacy? Gorbachev warned Reagan at Reykjavik that their window of opportunity was narrow. Time passed, things changed, the Soviet leader said. If they failed to agree, Reykjavik would be simply a memory. So I wanted to know what the lava thought <clears throat> of that. Words start war, and then war is wordless. Mistranslated missive, 
A missile begins as emotion, a sense the enemy is animal, like you. All life, brief as disaster, echoes the bang, and human code coils around a single fuse. At the frayed ends, world leaders ink out the legacy of manias. Aimless, that labor. All right. Um, I have two more to read. At the heart of this book are three double erasures where a priest, a scientist, and the vulva of Norse mythology interview the lava about the 1783 Laka Geiger eruption. Uh, this eruption lasted for, I think, eight or nine months, and it lowered global temperatures, and it had devastating consequences in Iceland and around the world. Um, in, uh, they think it was one of the original causes of the French Revolution, for example. Uh, it killed crops in Europe. There were migrations in Japan, migrations in Egypt. Um, the Chesapeake Bay was frozen. Uh, ben Franklin was one of the few people who speculated that it was a volcano in Iceland, but you know the communication wasn't what it is now, so people didn't know what was happening. Um, so for these poems, I move through the same text twice. So as far as I get, uh, you know, the interviewer finds a question, and as far as I get into the prose text, that's as far as I have to find the lava's response. Um, and though the situations are vastly different, studying the history of the Laki eruption gave me a way to think about our current climate crisis. Then as now, changes in climate affected every aspect of civilization from biological to survival to politics, religion, and art. Then as now, people work to facilitate human migration and the global distribution of resources. Somehow imagining lava's perspective provided a kind of consolation, kind of a tentative consolation. Uh, so to close, I'm gonna read, read two of these. Um, I also wanted to read these because the source texts are articles I could imagine being written by members of the Institute for Arctic Studies community. So this is how a poet might close read your research for rhymes. <laughs> um, in the first poem, the lava is interviewed by the Valspa of Norse mythology. And this is the prophet uh, that Odin resurrected, the one who predicted Ragnarok. The source text is by Gordon Jacoby, Karen Workman, and Roseanne DeRigo, and it's titled, the Lockheed eruption of 1783, tree rings, and disaster for the Northwest Alaska Inuit. Essentially, they did an interdisciplinary study that cross-referenced tree ring data with transcriptions of Inuit oral histories from the time period. And if you know the Valaspa poem, you'll hear I'm essentially translating that. There's another layer there. So I'll start by reading the first line of prose. Information about a severely cold summer comes from a book recording the oral traditions of the Kowarak people from Northwest Alaska. So this is in two voices. So I'm gonna just kind of go like this. <laughs> okay. Um, the vulva. Nine ages I read, tracing tree rings. When no light shone in the yawning gap, what were you? Matter begins as bodies moving. To see me, unscrew one eye to the socket and stash it in a well. Let salt unseal a story. And in the ill ages of ash, like a hound traversing earth, what did you seek? The orb spins. Villages rise again. Uncivil river, Death hewn, a plore song, listen. Songs of starvation and death survive ear to ear. I eye the ridgeline, rivering the softest rock to no more. Far back in time, the cloven heavens seared into us a century of wailing. Know ye more or not? Pattern sounder, Silmaril, by tree light, the world's in mourning. A stone knowledge gleams at the letting go. I unmake eternity, rewild gold, fluent as the migratory birds that reverse the ground. Describe being all exposed and here now. 
Walls fall in a wolf age, leakless the fields. There slain gods adorn the trees. Runes graved on bone draw sap. The frozen veins flash. Say it, words last. Poet, listen. So I'm going to read one more poem, and this is for all of you. I like this one because the source text was written by a team of geologists, Melody, and they cross-checked the effects of the eruption both in the rock record and in the written accounts of Icelanders who witnessed what was happening. And it's the combination of story and science, and I think that's a methodology we need in the age of the Anthropocene, in the hope for the Symbiocene. And I just want to say thank you once again to Sana and Melody and Lisa and everyone at the Dickey Center and to all of you for being here today. This is The Scientist Questions the Lava. There's a, and this is by uh, Thorvaldur Thordersen and Stephen Self, Atmospheric and Environmental Effects of the 1783 Lockheed Eruption, a review and assessment from the Journal of Geophysical Research. In the first week, the Lockheed plumes brought sulfuric haze, ashfall, and acid rain over the rural districts of Iceland to the south and southeast of the fissures, causing the sun to appear blood red and reducing its natural warmth. So this is also in two voices, so I'll be the scientist and the lava. Okay. Scientist. Define deep time. Fissures in the pasture. List skies, a rain of blobs and brine. Measure the ruin of days, a red sun shorn of its rays. The opposite of Lockheed is the past, the past. The past. What was fixed? What was fluid? Lobes crept in hollows, birds fled. Can we read this pattern as prediction, feel the scale? Hairs whistle, rivers dwindle, horses wail. Index the scene, smoke blue and reaching. Reenact the flows, no one alive knows. What lingers, danger. Draw the figure, fire. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions if people have questions. Um, Thank you. Yes, I was going to ask for questions. We have a, someone who will run with the mic. Okay. So. Sana, actually, who did the poster for? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Uh, people read, read poetry for form. That, uh, they read that, 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 that form is uh, really the book is all about it. I think we're um, And I, this is a great example to me. It's, it's really a very beautiful. Thank you, first of all. Um, um, I guess what I'm interested in, I, I, I just find a great mystery. Obviously, uh, this is a central question for you, and uh, you really have to seek out a form for this. And, it, uh, and, and it, it's a general question. Um, what is the process, do you think, for a poet? Um, how does that process happen of find, finding the right form for the content, the right package, the right package um, uh, to say what they want to say uh, that, that makes it art? Do you have an opinion about that? Yeah, my life. That is my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying, I think that is kind of, a, for me, in my experience, at the heart of uh, what poetry making is, is trying to find the, you know, writing in a form, trying to find the, the form that fits the content. They're the same thing, really. Um, you know, I remember people often think of form and content as opposites, but the opposite's the title, the subject is the opposite. The form and the content happen together. So your, your comment made me think of three things. The first thing was my students and I were just talking about um, this debate about whether poets compose 
in prose first and break it into line, or if they compose in the line. And when you're composing in the line, you're engaging with rhythm, and that's influencing thought. And so if you're composing into the form itself, it's shaping insight. Um, and so that also, you know, a technique that poets use is to, to take a subject that doesn't feel like it's working and, and put it into different forms. Mm -hmm. So in my first book, for example, I had a poem in 12 sections and um, uh, I showed it to someone who told me to take out all the punctuation and, and relineate it into this really small form, which I did. And I hadn't known what the poem was about. And when I did that, it became an elegy for my father. Um, so there, that is that is it. You're trying to find the form, and the, you're 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 working with it, and it's it's a constraint, and it's guiding you, and uh, it's form, but it's really about music, right? Because the form is music, so it's about rhythm, either spatial rhythm or um, actual sound rhythm. Um, but it is it is the everything. It is what leads to, for me to insight and. You know, poets work in, in the prose poem, that's also a form, which is also really amazing, you know, that you can still have the, po the poetic form in the prose poem, in the prose line, you know, um, but that's what keeps me going. I mean, I'm fascinated by it. So, and it, it, it's always teaching me something. So, yeah. Yeah. Hi, so I have a related, I, I think it's a related question about form because I was thinking a lot about um, uh, when I look at art, I'm always thinking about the revision process and what this was and what this was. And on the one hand, that's so evident here because you're seeing these layers really foregrounded that are showing me what it was. But on the other hand, for you, how do you come at revision for poems like these, knowing that there's such a like kind of mysterious divination that's happening as you uncover the words? That's a great question. It, it is, um, I revise these a lot less. I do revise them. So I'll, I'll get to a line that seems flat, and then you'll have to go back into, you know, wherever. You, it's almost like you've um, mopped the kitchen floor. <laughs> You're like, I, have, I can't move. I mopped myself into the middle of the kitchen floor. Um, so uh, I, I have this one poem that I was trying to find the word for opiates. Mm -hmm. And so I have my, I'm asserting a force. Like, I want this. I wanted the line to say this. And there was no P. <laughs> and, and so I went to the, I was at a residency, I had a, the Oxford English Dictionary, like a, was right there. So I went and I, I saw the available letters. So I went to the L-I and I found the word lithic. And the hair is what I was like, that's just like a hundred times better than opiate. That's, the lava is telling me Turn to stone, hello. You know, <laughs> this is it, you know. And that same poem, I recently asked, it was a, the weirdest poem in the book, it's about the lava says, I adore canoes. What? I don't know why that's in there, right? And I, I thought about getting the poem out of the book. Like, that doesn't really relate in some ways. <laughs> but then I saw The Fire of Love. Have you seen that documentary of the um, these volcanologists mm -hmm. from uh, Alsace? It's so beautiful. And, uh, there was a whole section about how he canoed on an acid lake. And I, again, I was like, this poem is very mystical. It's something, something weird. Anyway, so I revise these a lot less because it takes so long to find the words. But I do go in there. Um, well, uh, I'm going to out Rebecca here. Rebecca's a dear friend of mine. She's a choreographer. And I was just telling the story about how we collaborated on Governor's Island. And, you know, I'm so used to working on the page and uh, moving on maybe my yoga mat, which is also a page. <laughs> and um, Rebecca was teaching me sort of how to move around the field. And it was like my brain shifted. Just, oh, I don't have to stick to this little controlled space. And we com uh, composed a poem and we threaded it on long strips of paper through the, um, 
through the uh, chain link fence. Uh, so I no longer had to go vertically. We could, it was, you know, 10 city blocks long or something. We could just keep going. It's like a music. I could put the line up here, down here. It was just this incredible, in terms of form, uh, a, a sensing of a, a whole new way of working with form. Uh, and then Rebecca had a dance that she performed in front of that. And then the boats were going by behind that. So anytime any of it happened, it was creating all these different meanings. Yes. Uh, thank you, and I, uh, um, I, I'm looking forward to checking out the book. I haven't seen it yet in person, but I love how you embedded the imagery, you know, both the images in our mind and the images there. Um, I'm wondering, I don't know, because I haven't seen it, I don't know if you if you put the poem next to this, but I wonder if you've left it like this to allow the reader a chance to engage with it more fully, you know, because I, you know, I've seen Erasure poetry, but a lot of your examples um, keep the words intact, and here you're using individual letters, so I'm look, looking through and piecing together what those words are, and I don't know if that was a conscious choice to sort of get the reader involved in your poem as like an uh, active participant, or if it's just visually how you wanted to do it, and then you have another uh, version of it there, so. That's a great question, and this was, uh, we thought about this, left, right, center, we polled people, because there was, you know, I was at a residency, and all of the visual arts were like, do not put the poem in the next And then, uh, but Kevin, my collaborator, designed these to go with the, and it was hard, and so I had another person say, well, you should go image, image, poem, poem, image, image. Mm -hmm. But we ultimately did do side by sides. Uh, but we made these cards that are opposite sides, so that we kind of had a compromise there. Um, but it was a very important question. I feel like the bolder move would have been to separate them. Uh, but that was through a lot of conversations with, especially my collaborator. You know, I think the more I'm interested in eco-poetics, the more I understand it as collaborative. Mm -hmm. and. So many decisions, we, you know, we had to compromise and we had to, you know, this is his aesthetic and working, you know, there were so many conversations that went into the making of this book. And that was so important to me, that we could find a way to have both of our visions met. And so that was one of those instances. I won't work through all that. We did, it. I, think was, I don't know if you want to uh, There were, we told a bunch of people. This part of how we made it. Yes. Um, oh, wait, we'll get you quickly. Quick mic, just so people can hear you online. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, so I Okay. Um, I had two questions. So I was, my first question is, uh, why did you use erasure poetry as a form specifically? Because you talked about um, previous examples and why they did it and sort of gave us a background. But I want, want to know how you came to using it specifically for this project and your sort of mission with it. And then also I was curious about how you develop the voice of the lava. I feel like sometimes it's, especially, especially with like nature writing, you can sort of characterize or make a caricature out of sort of a nature figure. Um, and I was wondering how you're able to develop something that was authentic and how sort of the text behind this and the form sort of informed that voice. Awesome questions. First, I picked it because I, I imagined that when you put, um, the way that I knew erasure was additive. So I knew it as people inking over pages or as you can write out. And so I imagine, you know, you're putting liquid over a surface. So that I thought of it as very lava-like, that you know, something that's showing movement, and it's showing it's you know leaving high features in relief, um, and and that there's so much resistance in the composition. 
Oh, I, I, it was that really. I was trying to think about. To me, I saw this parallel, so that the lava might speak in this. And then uh, your second question was about how did, how did, how the voice came about, or how to. For me, yes. How do you avoid sentimentality when you're anthropomorphizing lava or something? So um, that's a really good question, and I, you know, I, there are ones in there that probably are a little more sentimental. But for me, I had a formula to make it strange. So, and I actually teach this uh, in another form. I could show you how to, how I did it and see. So. I gave it a secondary persona, and even though that seems like it's making it more human, so for example, that the, that the um, glacier is a Hollywood starlet, it makes the language strange. Mm -hmm. So it makes the language less predictable. Mm -hmm. And that somehow helped me to avoid the, sen I hope, the sentimentality. So it made it more complex. Um, and when I do this with my students, it's amazing what happens when you just add a layer of complexity um, to sound, to, so suddenly you're talking about, you know, the glacier, but you're talking about it in terms of um, yawning or, you know, something that, that, that would be totally unexpected. Um, but I, 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 have a, I have this page of notes of poets who are using speaking in the voices of creatures and features, and it's happening more and more. And there's a new book by Amitav Ghosh, The Nutmeg's Curse, where he's also calling for this, you know, how do we reconceptualize our relationship to the environment in terms of, and he's thinking of, like, how do we create narratives that are not anthropocentric in some sense? It's a, it's a negotiation, and I don't know that I always succeed. Uh, the short answer is I created this formula to make the language weird. But there are many poets who, who are able to do this without adding something like that. Like I just read um, Bettina Judd's new book, Feelin', and she has uh, 17 poems uh, in the voice of or around the, the whale in Pacific Northwest whose child is still born, mm -hmm. or whose whale, what do we call baby. And, uh, it's a thing, it's happening a lot, it has happened a lot, but that's a great question, like how do we avoid the sentimental, how do we avoid projecting too much onto it, um, it's a constant, I guess it's a negotiation. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, yeah. John, yeah. wait one more, Sala, your mind. Thanks. So you go to a lot of places, how do you know when someplace is poetry worthy. Mm -hmm. And how would you know if you were done with it? Like, could you ever imagine being done with Iceland? And how would you know? I don't know if I would think about like the second question first. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I feel that the book is done, but um, I am still writing poems about Iceland. Um, I'm working on one right now, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I also have discovered that it's not really about, and all, I teach creative writing in the environment, I'm always like, it's about the people. <laughs> I have been telling my students, just write what you're going to write, and, and when we're talking about the environment, that's gonna, that's how we'll think about the ego in your work. Because um, what I realized is why I write so much, it's usually I'm traveling with friends, and we're out on long walks, and we're having a conversation. And we're in, so it's it's this sort of nexus of relationship. So you're with people in an unusual place. You're having an experience together. So a lot of my poems are more about that, actually. Um, and I, I probably is similar to form and content, <laughs> you know? <laughs> The form is the environment, and it's it's allowing for that to happen. Um, so, well, thank you, everyone. I just I have to end by saying um, 
well, I, I'm incredibly moved, and I can't thank you enough for being here. I know you're going to speak to some students tomorrow. That's wonderful. Um, of our students, as you have students. I will say I wrote down, um, and I'm going to talk to you more about this, is you know, meteors per petrify me. I'm Earth's aorta. I crumb against emotion. That's, that, that just, as a geologist, I will just tell you that's just beautiful. I'm not sure how that came out of those writings. And the other one I'm going to hold with me and think about quite often is that the lava talked to us about uh, a hope for the symbiocene. And that's something that I thought was also something I will keep and hold and take with me. So thank you for this talk. Thank you to those online. Thank you everyone here. And uh, again, I don't think this is going away from our consciousness anytime soon. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> oh, that was good. <laughs>